Now, with growing concerns about the activities of Aisha Wan, a notorious Chinese lady, also known as the Galamse Queen in Ghana, President Ekofado says he is unsure she was initially deported from the country. Now, according to him, her re-emergence raises concern about whether she left Ghana in the first place, speaking on a whole base radio station as part of his tour of the Volta region, he expressed reservation about the nefarious activities of Ashawan and affirmed his support for her prosecution. First of all, mm. it's now a subject of national discussion. Okay. Everywhere you go, this matter of Galamse will at least achieve that purpose of heightening consciousness about it as an evil. Mm. When I came, nobody was talking about Galamse. Since we came and focused on it, it is now the subject of discussions in homes and offices and meetings all across Ghana. So that's one very po positive uh, development. Secondly, many of the measures that have been put in place have, have, are yielding fruit. The community of mining schemes that are being established across the country systematically are being rolled out. The efforts there are to uh, keep uh, our, our waters clean, not succeeded in their entirety, but some measurable increase in, 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 in performance there is also taking place. Generally, you can see that, yes, there will be sensational cases, mm -hmm. and the matter is not over. The Aisha Wang is now, is a sort of, uh, it's become a short form for everything to do with, mm. with, especially, unfortunately, with the involvement of foreigners, especially Chinese, in these illicit and uh, dangerous acts in our country. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded that much of the work that is being done, and a lot of these things are going on without too much publicity, is gradually, gradually yielding results. Um, when you have a situation like this woman who was, I'm not still sure whether she was in fact deported or whether she fled the country the first time mm -hmm. and has now come back, but whatever. Um, there still seems to be some uh, uncertainty about it, but whichever way it is, she has become the sort of nickname mm -hmm. for all that the Galapse represents. And unfortunately, also for the involvement of Chinese nationals in Ghana in this particular illicit trade. We have constantly to work at it. We need to have the cooperation of the courts. Until recently, till I came, the punishment for people caught was relatively light, a fine, and even if we're going to go to custodial sentences, it was relatively minimal. We've changed the law to stiffen the punishments for okay. people caught. For foreigners, I think it's now 20, 15, to, 15 to 25 years. Well, joining us live on this development is uh, security analyst Dr. Adam Bona through Zoom uh, for some in introspection on this. Many thanks for your time, doctor. Now, how do you find this latest concern about the president on Aisha Wan's deportation? Oh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pity and it's a shame that the number one gentleman of the land, who, according to security protocols, he must be briefed daily. Mm. He needs to know what took place 24 hours ago, and he must know what is likely to take place in the next 24 hours or be, and beyond. But unfortunately, from the way the president has spoken. And I'm happy he has admitted that he himself, as the most important person of our land, is not sure if Aisha Kwan was deported or she was just asked to go away and she ended up somewhere in Addis, Addis Ababa, and found her way back into this country. It, it is uh, an admission that if you ask me, Every security watcher, every level-headed Ghanaian will be worried. Every investor who is probably uh, monitoring would be worried because then uh, it means that those who are supposed to be briefing the, the, the president uh, in security, security wise probably aren't doing uh, what is expected of them. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, 
Uh, the president went on to talk about laws that are, you know, uh, you know, stiffing laws and all that. And the fact that we seem to be making some strides when it comes to the fight against Galamse. This singular uh, issue of Aisha Kwan, probably I would say has derailed every effort we might have put in. And I am saying that, go to KIA. Let's go for the records. I would want the president to probably from now on take it upon himself. He did say that uh, he's put his presidency on the line when the initial fight against Galamse started. So I would want to uh, hear the president or the president direct that from now on, he is going to monitor closely what is happening within the Ghana Immigration Service. Go to KIA. How many Chinese nationals are arriving in Ghana on, you know, taking visas on arrival? Mm, mm, they board mm. planes, go through either Dubai or go through, call it uh, at Addis or somewhere else, and they land at Kotoka. Mm. And visas are already arranged. This is, this is an open secret. And so as far as I'm concerned, I have said it, that if you put a retired and tired, uh, you know, immigration officer to be at the helm of affairs at the Ghana Immigration Service, then obviously those who appointed him will not be briefed because you have Techi who is supposed to be on retirement and he's been given two years contract. And I say that the situation is going to get worse if Techi doesn't go. Mm. Uh, but what does, what does this really mean for the security setup of the country, if the, the commander in chief is admitting that someone who was supposed to be deported, he cannot, uh, you know, say for sure that she was indeed deported. Well, it tells you that there are a lot of gaps when it comes to the security of this country. And I'm happy the president admitted, unfortunately. I'm happy because then it's been, you know, uh, all of us trying to tell the authorities, especially the immigration service, that they got it wrong. And in one breath, they come to tell us, uh, you know, they actually arrested her. In one breath, they come to tell us she used unapproved routes. And you have the government spokesperson on governance and security confirming what some of us put out initially, that she came through unapproved routes. And let me also say that let, let's use Aisha Wan's uh, probably arrest and prosecution as a test case, as a bold test case for the fight against Galamse. I have also called for the itemized phone records of Aisha Wan. If you see that itemized phone records, it's very explosive. Who Aisha Wan was talking to whilst she was illegally residing in this country. The telecom, she has two telephone numbers. Those two telephone numbers she was using to call her partners, some of whom are at higher places, some of whom we know, the telephone records from these telecom companies are itemized. We have the power, the courts or the, can the, the investigative team can actually get a court warrant and instruct if they want to do diligent work, investigative work. They can get a court warrant and ask the telecom companies that she was actually using, she was on their network, to give them, to give them uh, what do you call it, uh, her itemized bills, who she was talking to, mm. where she was traveling to, in and around the country and all that. You know the day and age. Once you use a certain type of, you use telephone, in fact, because we all connect by way of, you know, cell sites to one cell site or the other. So if I am going to Wa or Isa, where I'm from, you will connect seamlessly from one cell site to the other. So it is easy to say, Dr. Adam Bona is at the moment, you know, in this particular location, you know, uh, approximately. If it is not just a phone, but he might be there. And so mine is that the, the telephone records, the items records of Aisha Wan, will tell a lot of the lying, those who have been lying to the president. And some of these people who have been lying to the president know 
that they were actually in touch with Aisha Wan mm -hmm. while she was in this country. And when this issue broke, all of them have denied the, uh, knowing that she was here. And probably the court, the, the CJ, can actually direct that we can have a live telecast of Aisha Wan's proceedings in court. It is so important because we are getting to a point where our water bodies have all been destroyed, our forest cover has been depleted, and you have officials who are in cahoot with Aisha Wan doing this to this country. And I say, from the beginning I said it, it is a pain saying that you are proud to be a Ghanaian when you have this young Chinese woman come in, walk into this country with impunity, you know, when she's not supposed to be here, and our security couples are not even able to tell the president, as we speak today, that this is what happened. She was deported or she was not deported. Mm. It's a pity, if you ask me. Now, since you've had, you've had access to these data, who and who was she speaking to? Oh, you know I'm not going to. Uh, I can't share. Uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking them to. Uh, the security agencies have the power to actually go to court and, and dig out uh, what do you call it, uh, and get, uh, get a warrant so that her itemized phone bills, I am not, I mean, I can't provide you that. I mean, obviously, mm. uh, I'm not supposed to disclose it, but like I'm saying, I am saying if we want to do a diligent forensic investigative work on Aisha Kwan and the people she's been talking to, Aisha Kwan actually communicated almost all the time to China. Chinese people were coming in and out of this country through mm. Aisha Kwan. Aisha Wan was communicating to some officials in this country. Some officials do. Some officials actually visited her in her Ahonju residence. Mm. All these things, they can piece it together. You, I mean, it is easy. This day and age, if you commit a crime, unless the investigators don't know what they are doing or they want to cover up, but if you committed a crime and they wanted to look for you, Using your telephone number, which is unique to you alone in the whole world, they are able to tell that you were here, you were here, and even in some instances, you are able to record. We have the, the machinery to record conversations. So mine is that uh, let's not play down on Aisha Wan like Gabi, Mr. Gabi Ochirudako tried linking Aisha Wan's arrival, sneaking or arrive, coming, in, coming back into this country to you know, economic migrants who would go through Niger, Agadez, go through Libya, and go to Italy, comparing, a, a, you know, a gangster to, you know, people who are hungry and are walking to Italy and saying that, you know, we shouldn't make anything out of it because then, uh, you know, you cannot seal the border. It's like telling me that okay. the leaders of Boko Haram will find their way into the into U.S. mainland or in, in Britain or in Germany. And those who are in charge of protecting these countries will still be there. No. So if you tell me that Aisha Wan came and you have, uh, you know, uh, the, the president's cousin, uh, Gabi Ochedaku, saying that, you know what, uh, immigration, you can't. It is not true. All over the world, unless that country is not looking for you, they flag your details. Once you come in, it, you will not actually even be able to get it. But unfortunately, she got him. And so mm -hmm. mine is that, and I'm saying, televise uh, proceedings in court. We want to know what happened. Okay. Aisha Wan speaks three. She speaks fluent English, and she speaks uh, Mandarin. So she, I'm sure, even if they use a translator, we'll all hear it. And it, should, it will serve as a warning to others who would want to bring, you know, Galamseyas into this country, Chinese Galamseyas mm -hmm. and other people. So one, televise her proceedings to go for her itemized telephone records for us to know what happened. And then three, get rid of Techi because Techi is complicit in this whole thing that is happening. And as the president has just admitted and alluded to, he himself, if the president says, you know, I, I don't know what happened, whether she was deported or not, then me as an ordinary person, Bona, what would I, what can I say? If the president, the first gentleman of the land, says he has, this morning, you know, and the records are there how she came in. I'm just surprised that uh, they are not still briefing the president. The records are there. They, I mean, and one of the officers who facilitated it today is working 
at uh, what do you call it? Is working at one of our uh, important uh, gateways into this country. And my point is that let's not play down on this whole thing that is going on. Mm -hmm. I won't say it is state sponsored, but what I can say is that there are individuals who we are we are paying to protect us who probably are complicit, or I would say are complicit in this whole thing. So I'm happy the president has admitted, but okay. let's go beyond the admission and make sure forensic proper investigative machinery is rolled out to bring this whole thing to finality. What does this mean to our fight against illegal small scale mining? Well, do you? I don't even know whether this will be called illegal small scale mining. This is illegal large scale mining. If you know how this woman is so connected, you, you, how do we even define? Probably we need to look for those who are into mining to tell us what will constitute small scale mining. Is it the when you go underground that we call it large scale or surface mining to a certain extent? Because then what I shall want and her people have been doing. It will be difficult when they can go and, and clear a whole forest cover, clear a whole maybe 20, 20 football paths. They clear them just to dig gold. I don't know. So for me, the fight against illegal mining, I wouldn't call it small scale mining, illegal mining in this country. If you take Aisha Huan's case, I would say that we have not been successful as we should have been. Mm. We would have been more successful if probably the president would tie. DCs and MMCs, who themselves, some of them, are complicit in the fight against Galamse. Give them their KPIs. When they were appointed, nominated and appointed, you give them their KPIs. The key performance indicators, or yeah, indicate, you tell them, if anyone is found at your backyard digging the ground illegally for gold, you will be dismissed immediately if the evidence suggests that it is happening. You don't have to be linked to it. But if it happens, at your backyard, you will be fired. I think that the president can do us that favor because he appointed these people. He has a prerogative power to dismiss them. Give them, it's not late, he has two years to go. Give them, you know, these KPIs, let them know. Keep, the first thing should be illegal mining in these uh, communities where mining is taking place. You know the Buhaha surrounding the LMBLA, DC, and the police. And it is not just the only example. So mine is that. The fight against Galamse would be won properly if the president really looks at the structure, the organization, and look at probably the entire uh, structure of it. And this is most of them in the mining communities. Mm. I mean, any researcher will tell you that you can always quote Hadja Ali Mamama. Why don't you put them in a room and say that I know those of you, this is who are doing Galamse. So I will quote her that she said it, and some of us have the evidence that. Most DCs who probably are listening to me today from mining communities have their own excavators, have their own chamfines, okay. have their own gangs, mm. people who mm. are digging the gold, and no one cares. And if you know, if you even smuggle gold out of this country, and so, you are so, 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 Doc, on, 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 on this the, note... The sentence is death. Mm. On, on this note, who do you think should be held responsible for the gap in security in ensuring that people are able to do the things I saw one did? Well, I will say it is, it is you want to mention the national security, I'm told they were partly involved in this arrest, but I will say that you, you, it, it is an entire chain uh, attempting to connect it, I will say, in terms of Aisha one. First of all, if you ask me from where I sit, I will tell you that Techi should go. If Techi goes, because then Techi is directly linked to immigration. He is the head of immigration in this country. Some time ago when a certain police IGP said it is only in heaven, that crime doesn't take place. The president immediately relieved him of his position, brought a certain damper. Today you hear of uh, daylight robberies, at night robberies. There are motorbikes with police officers all over this country. So I am saying that with the specific issue of Aisha Wan, I say Techi has retired. The two years contract given him, terminated, bring a younger officer, like he did for Dampari to come. Get that, that officer inspired, for him to inspire other younger people. Because uh, for just the Ghanaians, our, you know, call them the, the, the local people, most of them are languishing in jail. Okay. But you have just two, two mm. Chinese people, according to Manasseh and his group. 
who are languishing in jail. So mine is that I would say that it's good the president has admitted, but you should go beyond admission okay. and look at it. Let's look for who uh, probably looked on for this. And now, if you ask me, if I'm supposed to advise the president through your media, I will say it is an entire, uh, you know, failure. But Techi, in terms of immigration, has failed. Okay. And so he should go. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. I'm grateful. Dr. Adam Bona is a security analyst there. This is uh, the news desk on the Joe News Channel. Now, two other stories. Some farmers and residents living along the flowway of the White Volta River in the northeast region have appealed for assistance to salvage their drowning food crops following the spillage of the Bagri Dam by Burkina Faso. According to the farmers, the damage to their farm produce will worsen their poor living conditions as they have invested their life savings into the farms. The dam was opened on the first of this month and is expected to coincide with heavy rains to cause massive floods across some 185 communities and affect an estimated 200,000 people in the north of the country. In response to the spillage, farmers in the community of Pasenpe have begun harvesting their immature crops as the spilled waters make their way to the farmlands. Correspondent Elias Utanko has more in this report. 53-year-old Alassan Yao is a subsistence farmer at Pasimpe community in the Westman Prese municipality of the northeast region. Together with his senior brother and two teenage boys, they have been working around the clock to harvest the crops on these two hectare maize fields in response to a flood alert issued by the National Disaster Management Organization. We hear that we are, they are going to store the Bagre Dam. And as of now, the maize is not yet matured. And if one is not mature like that, when you have them, you don't have place to dry them. So uh, normally, at us, most of them will spoil. So because of the bagley dam that we are harvesting them early like that. Alassan and his brother are among the dozens of local farmers yeah, in this community who have inherited farmlands within the buffer zones of the White Volta River and the flowway of the Bagrid Dam from Burkina Faso. The farmlands here are fertile, however, not conducive for cultivation during the rainy season when the spillage of the dam often occurs. During this period every year, Farmers are compelled to harvest their crops in their immature state. When they, when they open the water like this, at times our farm inputs, our farm, our farm inputs, everything will go away and leave us. And most of the point, it, it, it brings disaster to us. So when we are in it, fighting to get our food staff, maybe some of them will lose their life through that. So because of that, you know, it disturbs us too much. So we are building to in government or any NGO who can come and assist us to get do uh, that uh, canoes or anything that can help us. Even the water comes like this, we can be able to convey our things before the water comes and take over the, the land. Well, among measures to check the perennial challenge is the construction of the Polugu multi-purpose dam. Work is however yet to start on the project three years after President Kufuado cut sword for the construction. Here's an excerpt of our latest online documentary dubbed A Dam of Promises, detailing the status of the project. The ground to investigate the progress of work on the Pualugu Multipurpose Dam project. We begin in Pualugu. This was the exact area where President Nana Ekufuado cut sword for the construction of the dam. As we speak, there is no construction whatsoever going on here. But that is because, as Professor Miller revealed, there will be no physical component of the dam in Pualugu through the efforts of the assemblyman, Paul Abba Akanaba. The farmers agreed to meet us inside the Pualugu town. The assemblyman tells Joy News some officials engaged the people of Pualugu in some dialogues as part of preparations towards the construction of the dam. We have not seen anything physical that is done about the uh, dam. Uh, we know people have come to engage us in so many areas like uh, the effects of the dam, the benefits of the dam, and they even came to uh, take uh, measurement of farms that were affected uh, for compensation. They have also not told uh, the nature of the compensation. They have not told uh, how much an acre of land uh, would cost. 
Now, former CEO of the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority, SADA, Dr. Charles Abugri, worked closely with the Vice President on the concept of the dam. He joins us live with more on this. Good morning to you, sir, for your time. Grateful that you could, you could join us. Now, to what extent was the dam supposed to check the excess water spilled from the dam? Well, the dam was designed with sufficient uh, capacity to absorb uh, the water flowing from the um, upstream part of the dam area. That is from the Burkina Faso uh, to, to the dam site. Um, so th that, that was the, ba the basis of the engineering design. Well, but people have argued that the objective might not have been smart in resolving the perennial flooding as a result of the opening of the Bagri Dam. What do you make of this argument? <laughs> you see, the White Volta is a very low-lying river, and the flooding takes place at uh, multiple areas. So the Polgo Dam was a, was a first line of defense. The Polgo Dam would not be able to control flooding uh, say around the Sicily Pool Pond area or around the Salaga area where the dam, the, you know, the white water also passes and so on. So, but it was designed sufficiently to absorb all that water that is coming from upstream. Um, this is why the area that it is meant to flood is, um, is quite large. So it's going to flood a lot of areas. And so it's, I am not an engineer, but uh, the engineers that designed the tractor bell are more than 150 years old engineering firm. So I have no doubt that uh, they considered uh, the ability of the dam, the dam area uh, and the flooded area to absorb the water that comes. So you and the team that worked on it were, were confident that the Pualugu Dam was going to be able to absorb the spilled water from the Bagri Dam such that we won't have this, this uh, uh, flooding that occurs every year. You are very confident of this. As I told you, I'm not an engineer. Mm. But the, the, the starting point is this. Um, the, 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 the area um, upstream of where the dam wall is going to be will be flooded. That's the purpose of the dam wall. The dam wall prevents the water from going further downstream. Mm. So downstream of the dam, the flooding will be checked. Okay. Upstream of the dam, a good part of the Kusasi area will be flooded. This is the, this is the purpose. That, that's a, the deliberate part of the design. And that flooding, just like uh, the Akosombo Dam that flooded a huge part of the... Of, of, of the Volta region and parts of northern Ghana, the OT region at the area. Basically, it's like a soak-up, so it soaks the water. Therefore, downstream, uh, anywhere beyond the dam side, until you get to a place as far away as a Salaga area, that area's flooding would be managed. Similarly, flooding around the Sicily Kulpon River area would also be managed because the water would have been diverted into the dam, the dam side and to the mere. So mm -hmm. it floods one side in order to prevent spillovers into other places. But as I said to you, um, for, from the time that I was at, uh, at, at Sade, there is a series of dams that were designed. It was not a one-off dam. So the Polgo Dam is the first uh, point of call. Uh, the Sicily Kulpon Dam is another uh, point of call. Uh, there's another dam that was designed around the Salaga area. And so there's a series of dam, dam sites that are meant not only to control flooding, but to provide water for all year round uh, 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 cultivation. And you would also understand that the area around the, the, the Black Volta is not affected by the construction of a uh, a dam wall to, to manage the water upstream from the white volta. And mm -hmm. so if, uh, because of climate change, 
the, 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 the amount of precipitation increases in the upper west area. We will, the Bui Dam might be able to absorb quite a bit of that, but there are other dams that were designed to be able to take up, uh, to, to mop up that water for productive use. Mm. All right. Uh, so, so in summary, what would you say would be the difference with the, if this construction of the dam, uh, you know, is completed? It's fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a, I mean, of course, it has a cost to those who are going to lose their land. And let's be very clear about that. So the people in the Tanisi area and the, the Kusasi area will lose a lot of land. So that is, every dam construction has a lot of cost and that has to be dealt with. But it's, it's, it, it, its attractiveness is, is mainly twofold. Uh, the fact that it, downstream of the dam, it will reduce the flooding. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. The second is that there is significant amount of water for irrigation. And that irrigation capability is a nationwide asset. Uh, and the, the possibility to, to transform agriculture and agro industry in that area is great. It's 25,000 hectares. There's no irrigation scheme anywhere on the continent that big, you know, if it is actually realized. And the potential to turn agriculture around is, is, is amazing. Okay. And then thirdly, of course, there is some hydropower potential but it's not that big. That's that, so that the, 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 re, the revised design sacrificed the hydropower, but substituted it with, uh, with, with solar. So the potential is definitely, the, the developmental potential is really quite, is absolutely big. And of course, if you have a large water body, you can also grow fish. And you can do vegetables at, at, upstream of the dam. So if you have an investment in the community to be able to have fish, that's a fantastic, uh, you know, income source. Finally, it will solve the water problems for many of the small towns. So Wali Wali was factored into the design. But Polgu should be factored into the, the design for water. And okay. Zebile should be factored into the design for water. And therefore, to be able to mop up that water is also a means of solving the water problems. Especially as Northern okay. Ghana in particular is urbanizing very fast. All so right. the, the, the economic potentials are large. Thank you so much, sir. I'm grateful. Dr. Charles Abugri is former CEO of uh, SADA. Now, Minority Leader Harun Adrisu has said the NDC will resist any decision by the Electoral Commission to use the Ghana card as the only document for registration and voting in the 2024 elections until the card is made available to every Ghanaian. According to the Tamale South MP, the current challenges associated with the acquisition of the Ghana card are a deliberate scheme by the ruling party and its agent within the Electoral Commission to disenfranchise many Ghanaian voters. Speaking at the Party Youth Forum in Wale Wale, Mr. Harun Idrisu says the NDC demands the conduct of free and fair elections and will resist any conspiracy between the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and President Ekufuado to repeat the happenings in the 2020 general election. Elias Utanko has more. The leader was speaking at an event held in Wale Wale in the northeast region, organized to mark the sixth anniversary of the NDC youth group under the team The Role of the Youth in Election. Also in attendance, a specially invited dignitaries included the party's election director, Elvis Afriye Ankara, Fifi Kweti, women organizer Hanabisu. MP for Sanargu ABA Fusini, MP for Bunpurgu Napanduri Abednego Bandem. The event as well brought together several regional and constituency executives and party supporters from the grassroots levels. Addressing the party followers, the minority leader and former communications minister, amongst other things, criticized the government's symbolic handling of the registration process of acquiring the national identification card, also called the Ghana card. <laughs> The 
minority leader described the growing controversy surrounding the acquisition of the identification card as unacceptable, but said the entire process could be employed by the ruling party to perpetrate electoral fraud in the coming 2024 general election. He demanded on behalf of the NDC the conduct of a free and fair election in 2024 insisting the party will resist any effort by the ruling party to rig the upcoming election. So we are demanding the conduct of free and fair elections and we will resist any conspiracy between Chief Mansa's electoral commission and Nana Akufuado to repeat the happiness of December 2020. And we will do so jealously, religiously, within our right and defend our legitimate right and freedom guaranteed under the Constitution. Taking her turn to address the supporters, the National Women Organizer Hanabisu said without providing any evidence that the ruling party was trying to use the Ghana card to steal the next election and called on the party supporters to resist such a move. We are confident that we know that the NPP through the Ghana card is trying to rob us of our victory once again, even before the elections. The president of Ghana told all of us that he's not going to hand over power to any political party but the NPP. In that phrase, he meant that they have already lost elections 2024, but he will not give power. And so what we also want to tell them is that we are hungry and angry. President Muhammad said we are not going to any secret court, we are not going to any high court, we are not going to any Supreme Court, which means that at the polling centers we are winning to or die. On his part as the party's director of election, Elvis Safriye Ankara, insisted the NDC won the 2020 elections and urged the youth to unite in purpose to protect the party's victory come 2024. In spite of all that they did, the violence, the intimidation and all that, we were able to move our parliamentary seats from 106 to 137. And the NPP dropped their seats from 169 to 137. Even the 137, there are five seats that they took from us with the barrel of the gun, for which we are still in court. So actually, we won 142 seats. From Wale Wale, Elias Sutanko, reporting for Joy News. Yes, we're watching Joy News Desk. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll bring you letters from the world of business. Stay with us. Hello, good morning. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Leadership of traders at the Kumasi Central Market has cautioned against recurrence of what it describes as poor construction work at the phase two of the KGTI redevelopment project. The central market traders who are currently plying their wares at KGTI market say they have encountered challenges which hamper the smooth running of business. These include roof leakages and best pipes. Love FM's Mona Lisa from Pong has more. And and management of the Kumase Kedetia City Market have reached an agreement to undertake a monthly inspection of the ongoing reconstruction of the central market. The traders say this has become necessary to avoid any unfortunate experience after completion. Market queen for cloth sellers, Evelyn Yabwedu, spoke to Love News. <laughs> Every last Friday of every month, I was saying, 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 I was 
According to her, the traders are currently working with the managers of the market to ensure the new market runs a commodity-based system after completion. <laughs> T-shirt, <laughs> Chairman for Kumasi City Traders, Daniel Ankuma, says the central business district can only be decongested after completion of the central market project. They are therefore calling on the project contractors to speed up work to meet the deadline. Speed up. Mona Lisa Frimpon reporting. Now, technology and customer engagement platform in Ghana, M Notify, has launched its 10th anniversary celebrations. As part of the celebration, M Notify has also launched its new and improved customer engagement platform and mobile app. Chief Executive Ronald Tego told Joy Business the company will continue to contribute to the Ghanaian business industry and economy through the creation of effective customer engagement and communication tools for small scale businesses and large organizations. M Notify is a customer engagement um, company. What we basically do is to make sure that our customers are able to either grow their reach, engage their customers in a very effective, effective way, and build brand loyalty using basic tools like bulk SMS, voice SMS, and AI powered chatbots. I remember very well starting M Notify from KNST campus about 10 years ago, and here we are. It's been awesome journey. I'd like to say a very big thank you to all our customers, all our stakeholders, our mentors, anyone who has contributed one way or the other to the success of MNotify. And finally, I'd like to say that look out for more from us, look out for more um, value-added services, for more customer engagement tools, and look out for more on chatbots in Africa as well. And that's uh, it for business. Thanks for watching. Sports is coming up next. All right, so welcome back. It's time for sports, and the man Lawrence is already in the studio. It's Champions League uh, today. Is Champions League yeah, night today? Champions yeah? League night. Okay, uh, uh, but the top liner <laughs> is obviously Bayern versus Barcelona. Le Robert Lewandowski. We have the faces. Uh, people are saying he did damage with Bayern against Barcelona. So uh, once he's moved to Barcelona, he, he should also do damage against Bayern with Barcelona. Mm. Um, it's obviously a big one. Barcelona has had a good start to the new season. I think they've, they've, just, uh, they've dropped just two points um, since the start of the league. Mm. Uh, if you watch the first game in the Champions League, they did quite well. They beat Victoria Pleasant um, with a huge number of goals. So it's obviously a good start for Barcelona. They've, they've had a good campaign, like a good summer transfer business mm. and then they started the season well the magical summer transfer business people, people don't understand where barcelona all of a sudden got their, their money from no it's it's surprising but i'm not sure they got money because they still owe players they still they, they, they have still not you know they something. they had to activate some levers and all that whether that is 
uh, a kidney liver or whatever, they had to activate something to make things possible. Anyway. Um, but they did good business. Oh, yes, yeah. they did. Bayern Munich uh, quite well also um, started on a good note. The um, signing of Sadio Mane was quite a good one for them as well. They brought in the Senegalese player who did marvelous with Liverpool. He started quite well, but then his um, the last few games hasn't been to his best, and then hasn't been to the best of Bayern as well. But they are hoping that against Barcelona, a team that they, they, they've won um, 10 out of 15 games against, uh, they are hoping that they will get their mojo back, use that game as as a point where they can um, rediscover their early early season form. That is what Bayern are hoping today. If you're a Ghanaian, there's another game that you should be interested in, and that is also a big one. Well. Yeah. Not as big as Bayern. Uh, no, it is big for us. Yes. A game uh, in which uh, Kudus Mohamed, we are most, praying, to, would, would be a standout player like he did last week. The thing is, he's I the mean, most informed Ghanaian player. Yeah, exactly. He's been involved in five goals in the last three games. And that included last week when he scored and assisted in the game against Rangers. Mm -hmm. So this is it. And then weekend, he scored twice. He scored twice. Mm. You know, Kudus went into the season after a brilliant preseason. They started the games, four games, and then he's played just 29 games. It wasn't a surprise that... 29 minutes. Tw sorry, 29 minutes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a surprise that he boycotted training because he was itching for that Everton move. Because if you don't get any sense of um, the coach wanting you to stay, to play you, you actually want to move. But mm -hmm. after just a day, he came back, and then the transfer window closed, and he started getting minutes. That's where everything has changed for him. Over the weekend, Brian Bobby, whose position Kudus has now taken. You okay. know, Brian um, has a Ghanaian background, but yeah. then he was, he was born... Brobe, yeah. sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he was born in the Netherlands, so he decided, he decided to play for the Netherlands. Okay. So he, he was asked over the weekend how he feels about Kudus taking his position. And he's like, he's frustrated, but then at the moment you can't complain because Kudus is playing well. Mm -hmm. to, for someone to score in three consecutive games for the club, it's, I think it's massive. Yeah. You just can't complain. You just have to do your job when you are brought on. Mm. It's something that Kudus did, and then he's now getting the opportunities. So if I am Brian Bobby, I'm also going um, through the same process. Now, this is one unique thing about the Ajax Liverpool game. You remember two seasons ago when Kudus had a bright start to his Ajax career? Mm -hmm. Do you remember after moving from Nigerialand? It was against this Liverpool side. That he suffered that injury. Mm. The injury we kept him out for quite a long time. Okay. And that ten hug. So he, he, he was injured by, I wouldn't say he was, it wasn't an intention, but then obviously the things happen and then things go wrong. So Fabinho had that clash with him and then he had to go out for a long time. Mm. He came back, he struggled, and then thankfully, thankfully, I say thankfully because we knew the quality Mohamed Kudus has. Even in the Black Stars jersey, you see what he does. So where he got the opportunity and he's utilizing it, you only have to be glad. We are hoping that against Liverpool today, his, his, um, his light will shine once again mm. and then he will get Ghanaians talking. Because if he performs against Liverpool, just imagine the kind of... Already the UEFA Champions League handle has been posting him quite a number of times because of the exploits he did against um, Rangers. And his so, goal was beautiful. Good. So mm -hmm. if he add uh, that Liverpool performance to it today, it will be a massive one for Ghanaians. So it means that when we are saying a word of prayer to this morning, we say one for Mohamed Kudus, okay, to son. I just address him as, as, a, as a star boy. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, I guess we should now run our, our viewers through the games that we played tonight. Yes. Um, um, I think uh, there's in, in group, group um, Ayas group as well, mm -hmm. there's uh, AC Milan also playing. There's Victoria Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Victoria Pleasant are playing Inter Milan today as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is Sports Lisbon against Totia Mospe, Marseille against Central Frankfurt. Bayern, Leverkusen are playing Atletico Madrid mm. and then Porto against Club Bridge. Oh, nice. Yeah, these are the games for today. Tomorrow as well, there are, there are more games to be played. Very interesting games. Uh, and just by way of local um, sports happening, yesterday you know Kotoko won. Yeah, yeah, we won. We won a uh, uh, goal to, to nothing. I think the, the goal scorer is, is one player that we need to talk about, Isaac Opon. Okay. Injury robbed us of seeing much of him last season. You remember when they started seeing he, he was the game changer coming from the bench to do the marvelous things that Kotoko needed to win the mm. game. Mm. So um, yesterday, just when everyone thought Kotoko were picking up a draw in Benin, the boy turns up and says, hey, I'm here. He scores that. Yeah. <laughs> he scores the one that goal and then Kotoko take 
Because I got take Dali to Ghana. Maximum so, yeah. uh, point. So, Okuma Apema Apemba Apemba. is that. Uh, so, Kotoko uh, is going to go into the second leg with sure. an upper hand. We have three maximum points yeah. of that game, right? Uh, that's it uh, for you in terms of sports. And that's how we wrap up today's edition of New Desk, uh, News Desk here on the Journey's channel. There's more on myjoyonline.com. My name is Samuel Kojo Bristol. Enjoy your morning and enjoy the rest of our programs.